here. Today we are continuing our series in the life and ministry of Christ. This is actually the 20th uh, study in this series. Uh, next uh, Sunday morning, uh, Jeff will be preaching at 9 and at 10.15 uh, because Linda and I will be in Florida with the rest of our family. Uh, not uh, the part that had this little one that was running across the front here today. I knew sooner or later she would find out where I was. And when she got there, then when it came time for me to come up to pray, she wasn't moving. So her mother very graciously prized her away and took her to the nursery. So if you hear rumblings in the nursery, it'll be Linda's youngest granddaughter. <laughs> Acts chapter one, beginning in verse nine. And when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in the like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Father, we thank you today for your word. Give us insight and wisdom as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. I have been preaching the gospel since 1967. And the longer I preach, the more I understand how Paul must have felt when he said, I preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Every area and every aspect of our Lord's wonderful life and ministry yields abundant riches. There is a particular aspect of our Lord's ministry that is neglected in far too many of our books and is seldom mentioned in many of our theologies. So today I want to talk to you about the ascension of our Lord Jesus. <clears throat> A careful study of the ascension of Christ is like finding an untapped mine of wealth, an unexplained ocean of treasure, and an unsurveyed galaxy of glory. The life of Christ finds much fulfillment and meaning in the ascension of Christ. Every aspect of our Lord's ministry is important, and that's why we are taking uh, longer than six months to do this series. But the ascension takes its place right alongside all the rest of the other. In fact, the Apostle Paul, writing in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. The ascension of Jesus Christ is the culmination of his earthly ministry and the initiation of his heavenly session. Our Lord often predicted that he would ascend and go back to heaven. As he traveled on this earth, the Bible reveals to us that the cross was on his heart, but he was homesick to go back to glory, and he longed to be back at home with the Father. John chapter 6 verse 62 reveals this truth. What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? When Jesus prayed his prayer in John chapter 17, verse 5, he prayed words like this. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world was. So I want you to look with me, first of all, at the history of the ascension. Now, we know, of course, that all facts and all fundamentals of the gospel of Christ are rooted and grounded in history. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, that the foundations of the Christian faith is not based on old wives' tales or clever made-up stories, but solidly resides in historical fact. There are five uh, historical and extraordinary facts in the ministry of Christ. That is, his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and the ascension, <coughs> and his exaltation. 
I put in my email this week that you know, last Sunday was Easter, but Easter is not the end of the story. In fact, without the ascension of Christ, we will not have the return of Christ. So his ascension is inseparably linked to all of these, especially his incarnation. Jesus came down in his incarnation that we might ascend to glory with him at the rapture of the church. Christ in incarnation was clothed in humanity that we through faith might be clothed with him in glory. When you read the historical documentation of the ascension of Christ, we find basically two things in the scriptures. First of all, the documents record an exit. The Bible said in Luke chapter 24, verse 50, that when Christ took his disciples, he led them as far out as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed him. And from that place, Jesus made his exit from this world. There was no need for Jesus to stay here any longer. He had made the sacrifice that would reconcile a rebellious world to an outraged heaven. He had put his resurrection foot on the throat of death, and now it is time for Jesus to go home. He voluntarily lived in exile for 33 and a half years, and now that time was over. So the Bible declares that he suddenly broke the strongest law in the universe, and that is the law that keeps the earth in its place. The law which causes the planets to whirl around the sun, the universal law of gravitation was relaxed or suspended or broken to let go the sun of the living God. That law could hold the stars in their place, but they could not hold back the bright and morning star. They, the law of gravitation could hold the sun in place, but it could not keep back the sun of righteousness from arising with healing in his wings. Acts chapter one, verse nine says, now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. I believe that cloud was none other than the chariot of deity, the Shekinah glory cloud of the Old Testament. That same cloud that guided and guarded the children of Israel on their wilderness journey. The cloud driven by angels of heaven came to bear home to glory, <coughs> their blessed Lord and our blessed Savior. And so Jesus Christ supernaturally and miraculously ascended back into heaven. So there was an exit. The second documents record an entrance. In Ephesians chapter four, verse 10 says, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, plural, that he might fill all things. And so up he went. He went past the first heavens where the birds fly and the clouds are born. He went above the second heaven where the Milky Way is and the innumerable hosts of stars appear. And up he went into the very heaven of heavens where the very throne of God is. Peter put it this way in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. Christ has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers have made, been made subject unto him. What a glorious time it was when Jesus made his exit from this earth into the heaven of heavens. He who came to this world as the son of God goes back to heaven as the son of man. First Timothy chapter two, verse five, Paul says this, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And that is the most astounding concept that I know of in all of the word of God. And that is there is now a glorified humanity in heaven. He who came down, the God man, is now gone back to heaven, the man God. And there is a man in heaven ready to ascend the throne of David. 
And so Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, uh, so there is the exit and there is an entrance. And now I want you to look with me at the theology of the ascension. Now we know, of course, that the ascension of Christ is very much at home in the realm of systematic theology. But I want to point out to you, however, that the ascension of Christ is also equally at home in the realm of practical theology. In John chapter 16, verse 7, the Bible says, Jesus said this, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the heifer will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Therefore, the scripture teaches that it was for our benefit that Jesus ascended back to heaven. When Jesus ascended back to heaven, he ascended as our master. Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verses 33 through 36, Therefore, being exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father <clears throat> the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you see and hear. For David did not ascend into heavens, but says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. <clears throat> okay, hold on. I got to work on my frog. I wish my frog would get thirsty either right after I preach or right before I preach. Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 through 19 gives us tremendous insight about the Lord of glory. The Bible said, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him consists all things. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness of the Godhead dwell. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 8, that God has put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him, but now we do not yet see all things put under him. That is an amazing passage of scripture because the writer of the book of Hebrews says, we are living in this dispensation and he describes it with these two words, not yet. All things are not yet made subject to him, but it is the desire of our wonderful savior that you make him the Lord of your life. And as a child of God, Jesus decide, desires to ascend the high hill of your heart to be crowned Lord of all in your life. My friend, it is a biblical fact that Christ wants to be the Lord of your life because he has the right to be. Romans chapter 14, verse 9 says, For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. You see, Jesus ascended to heaven not only as our master, but he also ascended as our forerunner. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 I mean, Hebrews chapter six, verses 19 and 20 says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, 
and which enters the presence behind the veil, which the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Once a year, the Old Testament high priest would go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the atonement. And there, where the Ark of the Covenant was, by the mercy seat of gold, he would sprinkle the blood seven times before the altar to make atonement for the children of Israel. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 says, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So the basis for my cleansing and the reason for my salvation is the fact that I have a high priest in heaven who is my forerunner in the holy of holies. Jesus ascended to heaven not only as our master and not only as our forerunner, but also as our intercessor. (coughs) Romans chapter 8 verse 34 says, Who is he who condemns? Is it Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25 says, But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for us. The work of Jesus on this earth was historical and completed, but his work in heaven continues without intermission. On earth, Jesus Christ, by his work, acquired my salvation, and he gave me an Adam's apple that wore out some time ago. In heaven, he maintains my salvation And that is the basis of our eternal security. In fact, the Bible teaches us that we have a high priest in heaven praying for us. And the only way that Satan can get me lost is to stop the prayers of Jesus. And the only way he he can stop the prayers of Jesus is to get into the Holy of Holies. And the only way he can get into the Holy of Holies is to get born again. And when he gets born again, he'll not want to stop the prayers of Jesus. So that makes me pretty eternally secure, and that makes you pretty eternally secure. Jesus ascended to heaven not only as our master, not only as our forerunner, and not only as our intercessor, but he ascended to heaven as our victor. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 says, Therefore he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. That verse of scripture in Ephesians chapter 4 is a quote from Psalm chapter 66 verse 18. And it was a song of victory for David after he had rescued some captive Israelites, liberating them and bringing them back Uh, the captives, bringing the captives back with them as slaves. Therefore, another day on Calvary, when all hell rose up to battle against the captain of our salvation, the heirs of hell pierced against him as he hung on the cross. On and on they fought from nine in the morning until three in the afternoon. But when the dust of the battle settled, There was an empty tomb, and our Savior with the keys of death, hell, and the grave was on his way home, for he had won our victory. Last of all, last of all, I want you to look with me at the doxology of the ascension. When one studies the ascension of Christ, you will discover that it was the cause of praise in two worlds. 
In Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that news set those disciples on fire. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 24, verses 52 and 53, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and with continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. From that moment on, they lived looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not only was the ascension of Christ surrounded by earthly praise, it was also surrounded by heavenly praise. The angels not only minister to those of us who are followers of Christ, I am convinced that they also minister to the Lord of glory. You say, but preacher, do we have any evidence of that? Matthew chapter four, verse 11 tells us that after his temptation, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. I can hear the voice of the father as he cried out, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so today we have looked at the ascension of the Lord of glory. Now, for those of you that come on Sunday night, tonight we're going to look at this very same sermon again from a different perspective. But I like what the writer said when he said, just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old, old story. But when twilight falls, and the Savior calls, I shall go to him in glory. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, my invitation to you is simple, and yet it is profound. Today could be the greatest day of your entire life on this earth if you invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, forgive you of your sins, and make you a Christian. Being saved is not difficult. In fact, being saved is simple. The Bible said, if you believe on the Lord Jesus, the Bible said, he that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus made salvation simple. So simple that a child could come to Christ in simple childlike faith. Children know how simple it is to be saved. The problem is, when we get to be adults, we put more into it. We put do's and don'ts and cans and can'ts. We have theological truths and theological insight that we have to put into being saved. But I submit to you today on the authority of the Word of God, that's not what God did. God still has salvation simple. Just believe in the Lord Jesus. Ask him to come into your heart, forgive you of your sins, and make you a Christian. And I promise you today, on the authority of the word of God, your life will never, ever, ever be the same again. Let's stand together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you'll make this your prayer, I want you to lift your hands up. Said out loud with me, Father, your word is true. Thank you for the joy of, of salvation and the hope of heaven. Thank you for your word and the assurance that you ever live to make intercession for us. Thank you for the fact that I'm more than a conqueror because of my Lord who loved me and gave himself for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Whatever God's put on your heart, I want you to step out from where you are, make your way to the front. You come right now as God speaks to you.